Welcome, fellow plebs. My name is Sean, and this is Tribunus Plebis. And hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. We have talked about Mother Jones. We have talked about Eugene Debs. Now let's talk about the third member of the sort of holy trinity of 20th century labor organizers in the United States of America. A man who struck fear into the corporate dorks, who inspired his fellow workers, and who was bigger than life itself. Let's talk about William Big Bill Dudley Haywood. Standing at six feet tall and weighing well over 200 pounds, Big Bill was truly larger than life as he battled mining trusts, corporations, private armies, and government forces alike. He fought them with his agile mind, his calloused knuckles, and probably most importantly, he damaged them with his words. He, along with the previously mentioned Mother Jones and Eugene Debs, dominated the labor movement of the late 19th to the mid-20th centuries in a way that is still felt even today. Some activists may have been smarter in one way or another, some more well-read in theory, and others more effective at maneuvering, but none left as indelible a mark on the country as these three. And Big Bill? Well, he left a mark on the world unlike any other, and it all began in Mormon country. Now, before I really start here, I want to throw a quick note here that much of Haywood's early life is drawn from his own autobiography, a category of historical writing which both benefits and is hindered by the person writing it. In short, autobiographers, those who write about themselves, sometimes exaggerate and even lie. In Big Bill's case, his book seems more full of truths or closer to it than most, but I give you this warning to allow you to take these words, especially through the end of his teen years, with a pinch of that mineral which Utah is so famous for. William Richard Haywood, he would change his middle name as a teenager, was born in an adobe home in Salt Lake City, Utah, on February 4th, 1869, to an American father and a Scotch-Irish mother who was born in South Africa. His father, Haywood remarks in his autobiography, was, quote, of an old American family, so American that if traced back, it would probably run to the Puritan bigots or the Cavalier pirates. Neither case would give me reason for pride, end quote. Of his father, also named William, Haywood had but one memory of the man, and that was on his birthday when his dad helped hoist him over a fence and took him down to Main Street. It was there that he purchased the newly minted three-year-old Little William, his first pants, and a suit made of velvet. They then went about town together and visited the family friends on the way back home, and those friends gave the little boy treats and gifts until he was weighed down with money, oranges, and candy. William's father, a Pony Express rider, did not last much longer in this world, dying shortly after little William's third birthday while he was away at Camp Floyd, which would later be called Merker, Utah. When the Haywood family learned of the elder Haywood's sickness, William's mother took the boy and raced him to Camp Floyd to see her husband. But they arrived too late. He had already died and had already been buried in the local cemetery. When William and his mother visited the gravesite, William wrote this, quote, When we visited his grave, I remember digging down as far as my arms could reach. They then went back to their home in Salt Lake City, most famous perhaps for being the home of the Mormon religion, and the religiosity of the area permeated the city, though the Haywoods themselves were Christians. The family home was surrounded by polygamist families, some of them forming small compounds of different houses, one for each wife, and each wife having their own little family, with the patriarch visiting them all in turn. 
Haywood would even recall hearing the preaching of Brigham Young himself, the famed president of the church, in his youth. William himself would grow up to be an avowed atheist who was never shy about letting anyone in earshot know about it. Four years after the death of his father, his mother remarried and his stepfather, a miner, moved the family to a mining camp called Ofer. This is where they would live for some time. This is also where little Bill would first enter school. Of schooling, he says he was good in some classes and not great in others, with history and geography being the classes he excelled in and mathematics being the class he struggled with the most. One humorous anecdote he wrote of this time was that when his teacher, Mrs. Whitehead, left the classroom for some amount of time, she would appoint a class monitor to watch the class in her absence. One day, the monitor reported William and a boy named Johnny O'Neill for fighting. When the teacher settled everyone down, she called Johnny up front and whipped him with her ruler. When it was little William's turn to step up to the teacher's desk for his whipping, he bolted for the door and ran home. The first of several times that the young Haywood would not allow himself to be beaten by an adult. Upon hearing what happened, his mother marched him over to Mrs. Whitehead's house, where William claimed that he and the O'Neill boy hadn't been fighting, only quote-unquote wrestling, thereby implying that it had been a mutual game, not a fight. Mrs. Whitehead accepted this answer, this obvious lie, and the matter was closed. But Haywood finishes the story with these lines, quote, the matter was patched up, and I went back to school the next day. However, Johnny O'Neill and I had many a fight, both before and after this wrestling match. End quote. Anything to avoid a whipping, I guess. And hello there, everybody. As most of you probably know, this podcast takes a lot of time and effort to put together, and, to, you know, to get out there for you good folks to listen to. And you, our listeners, can help us by liking and subscribing on YouTube. So please take a second to click those little buttons. It helps a ton. And if you are feeling just a little bit more generous and you enjoy what we do here at Tribunus Plebis Media, you can help us earn just a little bit of money for the large amount of labor that we put into this thing by signing up on our Buy Me a Coffee page, where you can make a one-time donation or sign up for a recurring monthly subscription. We do all of this for free, and we will never run ads in our works. But any contributions really do help keep the show going and improving. The page address is buymeacoffee.com slash tribunusplebis. And of course, all links will be in the show notes and descriptions wherever you are listening or watching. Thank you. And now... Back to the episode. Sadly, schoolhouse whippings weren't the only violence in Ofer. And I think that says a lot about the culture, the time, the place, and the formation of who William would grow up to be. So I'm going to mention a few violent acts here to tell you what happened. Nothing too gross, but certainly tragic. William saw several gunfights which led to deaths, including having a man shot just paces ahead of him on the street he witnessed a bombing at a hotel. He heard a gunshot one day and rushed to the barn where it came from and saw a terrified schoolmate named Pete Bethel standing over the body of his other schoolmate, Willie Duke, after accidentally shooting him while playing with a gun that they found under a pillow. William notes how he saw the blood running out of little Willie Duke's head and then acknowledges that all of this violence happened during just his seventh year of life and he simply accepted it as a natural part of life. But all was not gloom and doom. Even the poor miners' children found respite around the mines. They collected crystals and rocks, and they played in the water. William took part in all of these activities, showing special love for collecting crystals from the open mine pits. And just to bring a dash of humor into this story, I'll share this story of youth from the autobiography. One day, William saw a pretty girl down by the creek and talked to her. When she smiled, he held her hand and kissed her, and he says that she seemed to like it. Then the girl was called away by her mother. The girl smiled over her shoulder at him as she walked away, filling his heart with joy. The very next day, William went back to the stream, 
because of course he did right. And he saw the same girl at the creek, and this time filling a bucket with water. He says he snuck up quietly and hugged her from behind, and she turned and attacked him with her nails, scratching his face. Then she spat at him and tried to throw the bucket of water at him, but he dodged and ran away, confused. William was quite befuddled by what had happened until he found out that the second girl wasn't his girl. The new girl was actually the twin sister of the girl he had kissed the previous day. And it was this very summer, the summer of his first kiss and his first rejection, when William wanted to be like the rest of the boys in town and carry a slingshot. So he collected some wood and went behind his house with a knife, and he tried to carve a sturdy handle from some oak. And while he was cutting, the knife slipped and it stabbed into his right eye. He was rushed to Salt Lake City for medical treatment, but, well, it was the 1870s at the time. And on the relative frontier, despite Salt Lake City being a town of some size. So there was little they could do other than keep him in dark rooms for as long as possible and hope that the eye healed. Little William spent months in the dark. He stayed in the shadows as much as possible until it was clear that the eye would never improve. He would be blind in his right eye for the rest of his life. That right eye would also become something which he would always be self-conscious of. He would get into many fights with the other boys who made fun of him calling him Dick Dead Eye or Squint Eye. He did note that he enjoyed fighting, something which would continue into adulthood for whatever that's worth. The self-consciousness over his eye would actually continue into adulthood as well, as he refused to have planned photographs taken unless they used his left profile. And there are just a few more aspects of Haywood's youth here that I want to talk about before getting into his career. The first is his love of Shakespeare, inspired from working as an usher at a local theater. Another is how his last professor at school inspired William to love history and gave him the tools needed to dig below the surface for real, actual truths. Then there was his first job, where he was contracted to work for six months as labor on a farm owned by a man named John Holden. On the farm, William milked cows, raked, cleaned, basically anything Holden wanted. And one day he was working out in the field plowing, and he found a nest of field mice. Being a child and having never seen field mice before, he stopped to watch the mice and knelt beside the nest as he did. William knelt there watching these little critters right up until the moment when the bullwhip bit into the flesh of his back. William leapt up in pain and he ran straight for home and didn't stop until he got there. The next day, Holden, the man with the whip, showed up and apologized for striking William and promised to never do it again. And William went back to work, albeit a bit reluctantly. Haywood notes in his autobiography that Holden was a cruel man to his animals and to his wife and just in general was a bad person. But he did finish out his six-month contract and looks back on the episode as his first strike, his first labor action. It also set in him a firm distrust of contractual labor, which he would carry with him until his death. The last thing I'm going to mention here from William's youth happened when he was 12 years old. One day he saw a policeman leading a black man to jail. It seemed as though the black man had murdered a police officer. As they dragged the man along, William noticed that they weren't taking the most direct route to the station. Then he saw that they just weren't going to the station at all, and that the crowd had begun to grow very large. And then he heard when people started calling for a rope. William says how confusing it was. Why would they need rope? The policemen have this black man held good and firm. They don't need any rope. Then they threw the rope over a beam, and the noose hung there in the air, and the confusion was solved. William stood there shocked as he witnessed the lynching of this black man by the police and the gathering mob. I think that the following passage says a lot about what William learned that day. Quote, I looked at the swinging figure and thought over and over, what have they done? What have they done? It was as though a weight of cold lead settled in my stomach. The leaders of the mob were not satisfied with the death of the man. Someone cried out, drag him out and quarter him. 
hang him to a telegraph pole. They dragged the limp body by the neck to the corner of the street where Mayor Wells drove up and read the riot act, ordering them to return the body at once to the jail. This was my first realization of what the insane cruelty of a mob could mean. I learned then, too, that the mob was not composed only of those who would be willing themselves to do the dreadful deed that was done, but many were there out of curiosity to see what was going to be done. Each one there lent the strength of his presence to the leaders. I don't think more than three or four men there really wanted to kill that man. End quote. And I know I just said that this last story would be the last of his youth, but speaking of black people, another event further influenced Williams' views as he attended a speech given by Senator Ben Tillman of South Carolina. After the speech, the senator opened himself up to questions, and the black man sitting next to William asked the senator a question, and Tillman responded with a racist tirade full of insults to both a black man personally and even to his mother. As the senator ranted, Haywood writes this, quote, I looked at the man, and his pained expression caused me forever after to feel that he and his kind were the same as myself and other people. I saw him suffering the same resentment and anger that I should have suffered in his place. I saw him helpless to express his resentment and anger. I feel that Ben Tillman's lectures must have made many other people feel as I did. It seemed to me that I could look right into the breast of old Tillman and see his heart that was rotten with hate. End quote. Those last lines also remind me of Eugene Debs' famous lines as he was about to be led to prison when he said, While there is a lower class, I am in it. Both Debs and Haywood are speaking of real, actual solidarity here. As William turned 15, his mother and stepfather felt that the best course of action was for him to learn a trade. One of their neighbors was looking for an apprentice boilermaker and offered the spot to Haywood. But when the talk of a contract came up, William rebelled. He had been bound to a man once before, a cruel, sadistic man who had literally whipped him for being a curious child, and he would never allow himself to be bound in such a way ever again. Now, this decision was effectively the end of Haywood's childhood, and the end of this current life in Utah as well, as he had decided to go work for his stepfather at the Ohio Mine and Milling Company in Humboldt County, Nevada. But before he left, he would do one last thing only for himself. He would change his middle name from Richard, his uncle's name, the uncle who had contracted him out to Holden and whom William very much disliked, Little William changed his middle name to that of his father, Dudley. William Dudley Haywood. Before William left, he purchased a few things. Some new clothes, a chess set, some boxing gloves, boots, and overalls. His mother made him a big lunch when he left, mostly consisting of plum pudding, and said, You will be back in a few weeks. William would, in fact, come back to Utah, but not for some time, and he would come with a woman on his arm. The mining camp in Nevada was effectively in the middle of nowhere. It sat 60 miles from the nearest road and four miles away from the nearest neighbor. The closest saloon was six miles away through the scrublands and was rarely visited by the men of the camp. It was here that William lived with the older miners and his best friend, Tim. Tim was a large shepherd dog who lived in the camp. Tim was, according to Haywood himself, even with his own stepfather running the place, a bit of a lifeline for a 15-year-old boy living in a bunkhouse full of those older men. It was also the case that William actually learned to actually live with these old miners and learned exactly what it was to be a worker and how to rely on not just yourself, but also your comrades down in the shafts. Along the way, he started to learn the art of assaying, even going so far as to apply to two different mining schools with the goal of becoming an assayer himself. But really the heart of the story in this early Nevada mining days was the camaraderie and the sacrifice and the good times sitting around the fire playing chess and reading books. Books which the miners eagerly collected and traded amongst themselves, including everything from Darwin to poetry and Haywood's own contribution, a book about baseball. Daily papers also arrived, often weeks late, 
But to the men of the mine, this mattered very little, if at all. They were just glad for some news. As to the camaraderie, William was befriended by an old-time miner called Pat Reynolds, the oldest man in camp and a member of the Knights of Labor, the largest union in the country at the time. He was described as a tall, raw-boned, red-whiskered Irishman, and it was Pat Reynolds who began to teach William Haywood about the class struggle and the idea of workers unionizing and organizing both for mutual aid and mutual protection, things which William had never heard of, nor had he ever really considered them to be needed. When Haywood looked across the cabin at the boss and pointed out that the boss wasn't living any differently than the men he supervised, Reynolds gave him an important lesson when he told William that this was not the real boss. This was just a fellow worker who was getting an extra few coins every week to watch over things. The reality is that nobody knows the real boss, Pat went on. None of these miners have ever met them. The real boss lives on an estate on the California coast being paid for with money that they never earned, while the workers lived 40 to a shed in the middle of the Nevada desert, while the money that they earned was shipped to California to pay for that estate. Old Pat Reynolds told young William Haywood that for the working class to be fully emancipated, then the workers themselves must fight for it and accomplish it for themselves. William heard the message, but it would be many years before he truly understood what it meant. In May of 1886, the importance and truth of that message began to settle firmly into the mind of Bill Haywood, and he will be Bill or Big Bill Haywood from here on out as I tell this story because this is where he truly started to become the man whose story has fallen to us through history. It started when he began to read about the Haymarket Massacre and the speeches given by the men who had been put on trial and the martyrdom of those men. The long and short of the Haymarket Affair is that during a gathering of anarchist and labor activists, an unknown person hurled a dynamite bomb at the police in the crowd. The blast and an ensuing gunfight led to the deaths of seven police officers, four citizens, and dozens of wounded. The ensuing trial captivated the nation and led to guilty verdicts for seven people, four of whom would be executed. Despite the verdicts, few people truly believe that justice was served, and it is universally agreed upon that the person who actually threw the bomb was never caught. In the aftermath of Haymarket, the anarchists who were killed in response became martyrs to their cause, and the entire episode became an inspirational call for organized labor across the country. According to labor historian William J. Adelman, quote, No single event has influenced the history of labor in Illinois, the United States, and even the world, more than the Chicago Haymarket Affair. It began with a rally on May 4th, 1886, but the consequences are still being felt today. Although the rally is included in American history textbooks, very few present the event accurately or point out its significance. End quote. Haymarket even had a big hand in the establishing of May 1st as International Workers' Day. Particularly striking to Haywood, were the final words of August's spies, one of the anarchists who were murdered by the state in retaliation for the bombing. Quote, The day will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you are throttling today. End quote. These words are now carved on the Haymarket Memorial in Forest Park, Illinois. It was shortly after this period when the Nevada mine fell into financial trouble and it was quickly shuttered. Bill Haywood was left in charge of the camp where he lived alone with only his dogs for company. His first lesson in how quickly work can dry up and how quickly your life can be turned on its head, but it was certainly not his last lesson in either regard. After a time, after a time, Haywood left Nevada for Utah to work the Brooklyn Lead Mine, a dangerous mine with plenty of injuries and death, but also the ever-present danger of lead poisoning, which sent a steady stream of men going back and forth to the local hospital to be treated for the persistent sicknesses which the mine operators took no steps to alleviate. While at the Brooklyn mine, Bill sent for his sweetheart from Nevada, a girl named Nevada Jane Miner. They were quickly married and moved to Salt Lake City where their first child was born, a boy they named Vern. 
Vern died shortly after being born. The grieving couple quickly moved back to Nevada, where Bill took work on a ranch as a cowboy. Here he worked for a few seasons. Nothing of too much note took place other than his wife giving birth to their second child, a healthy, bouncing baby girl. And I suppose I should note here that when his wife went into labor, they could not make it to a doctor and the midwife was not present. William rushed his wife to the nearest neighbor, the Vances, and managed to get word to his mother-in-law, who arrived just as they did. Upon entering the home, Mrs. Vance fainted away and fell to the floor. Soon, Jane's mother fainted and fell to the floor beside her. With nothing else left to do about it, Bill Haywood delivered his own daughter, even cutting and tying the umbilical cord himself. The two ladies on the floor did not come to until Haywood himself had cleaned up the afterbirth. But despite all that, Henrietta Haywood came into the world healthy and beautiful. It was shortly after this birth that the Haywoods received what they believed was the chance of their lifetime, an opportunity to homestead. Homesteading involved being given a parcel of land by the government, and the recipient was required to build a home and to till and farm the land and improve it for five years. After this period of time was up, the government would transfer the title of the land to the homesteader. The land and all of the improvements upon it would become their own. Bill and his family moved onto the plot, and he built them a home and began to work in the fields, and he worked at it until he ran out of money. When he was nearing the end of his funds, he looked for work, and he found a job. Bill Haywood went to work at a mine 125 miles away from his homestead, making the trip back and forth as often as he could, and building his home, placing fence posts, stringing wire, and tilling his fields whenever he was there. On one trip back to the mine, Haywood stopped at an abandoned fort and found four other men inside of it, and they pooled their resources together to make a full dinner. As they sat eating, one of the men suddenly stopped and said, what an odd group of men they were. When he was questioned, he said, well, every man here has lost an eye. And upon closer inspection, it was indeed true. All five men in that fort were one eye short. The Haywood family would continue this pattern for a few years. Bill going off to work at this mine or that mine, whichever had jobs at the time. Then he'd come home and improve the homestead until they ran out of money and then do the same thing all over again. Sometimes mixing in other sorts of work, teamstering, wrangling, odd jobs, anything he could find. Bill kept it going until they got bad news. The homestead was being taken away. The government was going to turn the area into an Indian reservation, and they had to leave. This news was greeted with relative aplomb by the Haywoods, at least according to Bill's lack of complaining in his autobiography. And in an act of, I guess, Old West-style stoicism, they packed up their things and moved to Silver City. Bill arrived first and took work in a mine. It was here that two things happened right in a row. The first is that he heard the tale of a Pinkerton detective who had infiltrated the miners and even become a Molly Maguire, a possibly fictional secret society of radical activists. There's a bit too much here, you know, for an episode about Bill Haywood, so I'll let the listeners investigate the Molly Maguires themselves or just wait for the eventual episode I will do. But nonetheless, this detective orchestrated a murder which involved, in some form or fashion, about a dozen miners who were all charged with murder. This was Bill's first experience with what he would learn are called agent's provocateur. The second thing that happened is that while he was hitching a ride in an ore car to exit the mine, a large rock dislodged and struck a metal chute, which in turn crushed Haywood's right hand between the chute and the wall of the car, badly mangling the hand. The chaos of the crash snuffed out Haywood's candle, and he was left to stumble in the pitch blackness of the tunnel until he managed to stumble upon another miner named Big Barney Quigley, who helped lead Big Bill to safety with his own candle as guide. At the hospital, the doctors recommended immediate amputation, but Haywood refused, saying that he did not want to be doubly crippled after losing his eye as a youth. So the doctors relented and did their best to save the hand. 
Big Bill spent a long time with his arm in a sling, but the hand did eventually begin to mend, though it was never as fully useful as it was before the accident. The injury did, however, leave him unemployed at the worst possible time. Even as Bill was looking for a house to live in, while suddenly unable to work due to his hand injury, his wife and baby daughter arrived in the city, and this is where the lessons of Pat Reynolds, that old Irish union man who had taught Bill about the unions and the concept of solidarity, ideas which Haywood understood to a certain degree, but the true meanings of which had never been fully registered, really came home and took root. While the Haywood family was lodged in the Idaho Hotel, at a time when Big Bill must have been feeling so much desperation, his fellow miners took a collection up amongst themselves, and a group of them presented the Haywoods with a purse stuffed full of money. Not only did this money very likely save the Haywoods' lives, but it also helped enable Bill to put a down payment on a home and move his new family in. This act of kindness and solidarity from his fellow workers, men of no great means themselves certainly, was something which would forever sit in a place of honor amongst all of Big Bill Haywood's memories. And it was about a year after this, in August of 1897, when Edward Boyce, president of the Western Federation of Miners, entered the area and arrived in Silver City with the intent of unionizing the city's miners. He presided over two meetings that August, one on the 8th and one on the 10th, and Big Bill attended both of them even as he harbored doubts about ever being able to mine again. Bill Haywood signed the charter of the Silver City Miners Union No. 66 of the Western Federation of Miners and was soon elected to the Finance Committee where he worked doggedly in support of his fellow workers. This would be Haywood's first official entry into the American labor movement, and for the rest of his life, he would be entirely consumed with that particular struggle. Over the next five years, Haywood's star would rise through the ranks of the WFM, with him serving in various committees and being one of the most active members of the union, missing only the meetings where he had to work the night shift to make ends meet. Along the way, he truly earned the nickname Big Bill, as he let loose with superior oratory skills, backed by his famously booming voice and a unique ability to motivate, cajole, and activate the working class who turned out for his speeches. Plus, the willingness to get pugilistic when the situation warranted such an approach. By the time Boyce, the man who originally inspired Haywood to sign up, retired, he recommended that Big Bill Haywood and a man called Charles Moyer should lead the union into the future together. Moyer would be elected president of the WFM, and Haywood would be elected as secretary-treasurer, effectively the second-in-command after the president. In a lot of ways, this was a very poor duo to hold so much power between them. Charles Moyer was a bit of a pacifist and favored negotiations in cooperation with capital and state to achieve the union's goals while Haywood tended to instinctively fight and was very antagonistic towards ownership and capital and preferred radical and volatile confrontation rather than negotiating over tables. It was during this time that Haywood developed one of his first real platform policies, the eight-hour workday. This wasn't Haywood's original idea. It had been lingering around for a while, but he was certainly one of the primary people to bring it to prominence in the labor movement. Bill would routinely march around his men and shout out with that booming voice, eight hours of work, eight hours of play, eight hours of sleep, eight hours a day. Today, this might not seem radical, but in 1902, an eight-hour workday standard would have been revolutionary. In 1903, Haywood led the Union strike campaign in the Cripple Creek region, meant to bring the benefits gained by WFM members to non-union workers as well, an action which kicked off a series of events referred to as the Colorado Labor Wars. This would be, as far as I can tell, the single largest labor action which he would lead. Haywood argued that miners were exploited by barbarous gold barons who did not find the gold, they did not mine the gold, they did not mill the gold, 
but by some weird alchemy, all the gold belonged to them. The war was, according to one historian, the closest the United States has ever approached outright class warfare. Unfortunately, the capital class had class consciousness aplenty and used Pinkerton, Baldwin Feltz, and Teal detectives, vigilante groups, and the Colorado National Guard to violently suppress the strike, leading to the deaths of 33 miners and the deportation and expulsion of hundreds of more union members and supporters. And this is probably a good spot to talk about how, at this particular time in history, the predominant labor movement and unions was craft unionship. In craft union systems, a factory that produced something like sweaters would have different unions for cotton spinners, yarn makers, knitters, seamstresses, finishers, and packagers. Every different section would have its own union. This was a method which was preferred by the capital owners because it kept the working class divided by forcing each portion of the workers to effectively bargain in their own interest to the harm and detriment of the other portions and thereby create antagonism. The other aspect of this system was that so-called unskilled workers would not be unionized at all, creating yet another tier of workers and further antagonism. Between the differing views of leadership, conciliation versus fighting, and the crushing of the Cripple Creek strike by the state, Big Bill's antagonistic class-based views came into a clearer focus, and he began to envision one big union, a union of all workers organized along industrial lines with the aim of developing a broader, deeper working-class consciousness and struggle. In pursuit of this very ideal, in late 1904, Six radical labor leaders met quietly in Chicago to discuss the future. At this meeting was birthed the idea that would become the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, a union dedicated to creating one big union, general strikes, and class solidarity across all workers. The IWW was officially founded in June of 1905 in Chicago when about 200 socialists, anarchists, and labor organizers met and set themselves firmly against the attitudes of Samuel Gompers and the American Federation of Labor and their conciliatory relationship with capital. Big Bill was there as a representative of the WFM, one of the first unions to sign on with the new organization. Haywood opened the first convention with these words, quote, Fellow workers, this is the Continental Congress of the Working Class. We are here to confederate the workers of this country into a working class movement that shall have for its purpose the emancipation of the working class from the slave bondage of capitalism. The aims and objects of this organization shall be to put the working class in possession of the economic power, the means of life, and control of the machinery of production and distribution without regard to capitalist masters, end quote. Eugene Debs and Mother Jones were also in attendance and spoke as well. The Holy Trinity of American labor united in cause for at least this one short period of time. The Wobblies, as IWW members were known, became an immediate force across the country, but especially amongst the Western Expanse and the Pacific Northwest in particular. Their successes, their strikes, and their growing membership roles put a target firmly on their backs, and amongst Wobblies, no man had a bigger back to target than the pugnacious Big Bill Haywood. The very next year, 1906, would see the first attacks on Big Bill, both from capital and from the government itself. In December of 1905, Frank Stonenberger, a former governor of Idaho, was murdered by a man named Henry Orchard. Orchard was, at one time, a union member, and he was also a paid informant to the Cripple Creek Mine Owners Association, one of the private groups who resisted and eventually violently put down the Colorado Labor War, an Old West double agent. By February of 1906, using a legal contrivance of dubious merit, Bill Haywood, Charles Moyer, and George Pettibone were all arrested. Without warrants being issued, 
and then literally kidnapped and transported across state lines in the dead of night. They were then placed on death row in an Idaho prison upon arrival. It was here that the three men were left to believe for nearly a month that they would be executed for a crime which they all knew that they did not commit. After all, when you have been illegally kidnapped, illegally extradited across state lines, illegally held in prison, and sat on death row, across from the very hanging house where they hung criminals by the neck until dead, the implications were very clear. And in a cell like that, there is not much else to occupy the mind. Haywood himself did his best to avoid such thoughts, spending much of his time reading and smoking cigars which were brought to them. But always, 24 hours a day, sat across from him a stone-faced guard, a guard meant to keep them on death row, and a guard who would have been one of the men to place his neck in a noose. So the thought certainly crept in. The three men sat in those cells for over three weeks before being moved to a safer county jail after much protest. The circumstances of the kidnappings and the imprisonment were so egregious that even Samuel Gompers and his American Federation of Labor, which stood starkly against all of Big Bill's and the other two men's organizing ideals, raised money to assist the men. In addition, letter-writing campaigns from across the country piled into the governor's desks in both Colorado and Idaho, and eventually the pressure mounted enough to at least move the men to a safer, more appropriate jail. As for the trial itself, Haywood was represented by famed and infamous lawyer Clarence Darrow, and Moyer and Pettibone would be tried later and separately from Haywood. The trial was the trial of the century for that year. Trials of the century of the year would sort of become Big Bill Haywood's thing, actually. Anyway, the trial was covered by all of the national newspapers and news organizations and drew interest across the nation from coast to coast. Orchard, the capital spy, repeated his earlier confession and accusations that he did indeed murder Stonenberger and that the orders came directly from the three defendants, including Big Bill Haywood. Eighty witnesses came forward for the prosecution. One hundred witnesses came forward for the defense. Over several months, both sides made their cases, and the rubbernecking followers across the country were heavily on the side of the prosecution. They all believed Orchard was telling the truth, and that our hero here, Big Bill, was in fact guilty of ordering an assassination. When both lawyers gave their final arguments, Darrow's speech was almost universally condemned for its frank and emotional language. The Chicago Tribune called it, quote, the most unseemly, abusive, inflammatory speech ever delivered in an American courtroom, end quote. The large majority of the public expected a quick guilty plea after following along in the papers. Bill Haywood had become a villain in the extreme to most of the American people. An assassin, a bully, a thief even. The nation was ready to cheer that this devious, filthy miner would get what he deserved. The rope. What they got instead in late July was an acquittal for Big Bill. The nation was, to say the least, outraged. Soon afterward, Pettibone would be acquitted as well and the charges against Moyers would be dropped. For the Union men, and Haywood in particular for this story, the trial was a success, or, you know, as much of a success as could be achieved under such circumstances. No trial for murder in a hostile state with a noose looming at the end of it is really ever a good thing, but the men walked free regardless. Our hero was back to his family, and his brothers in the Union. But all was not well. The broader country was horrified by the murder of Stonenberger, the accusations against the Union members, and even to the outcome of the trial. After all, most people had believed that the men would be found guilty, and justly so, at least in their eyes. 
While the trial did indeed clear Haywood of all charges related to these assassinations, it did something else as well. It gave him a celebrity-like nationwide fame. With this fame came demand. Demand for travel and demand for speeches. Both within the WFM, the Western Federation of Miners, and throughout the country for the IWW and other labor organizing and fundraising efforts. As Big Bill delivered speeches across the country, his rhetoric became more radical and more militant, and his words received more and more coverage in newspapers, nearly all of it critical. He became famous for his homespun aphorisms. Here are some of my favorites. I've never read Marx's Capital, but I've got the marks of capital all over my body. If one man has a dollar he didn't work for, some other man worked for a dollar he didn't get. I previously mentioned this one, I think. The mine owners did not find the gold. They did not mine the gold. They did not mill the gold. But by some weird alchemy, all the gold belonged to them. The capitalist has no heart, but harpoon him in the pocketbook and you will draw blood. And finally, tonight I am going to speak on the class struggle and I am going to make it so plain that even a lawyer can understand it. Along the way, Bill would organize thousands of workers, especially around Colorado. But he would also piss people off, including Moyer and the rest of the leaders of the WFM. In 1908, the WFM withdrew from the IWW, and Haywood remained a member of both unions for about a year afterwards until his still-increasing rhetoric and the Western Federation of Miners fall back to placidity made a split from the WFM necessary, and he concentrated all of his efforts on the Wobblies. In the following years, IWW membership grew steadily but erratically. Obviously, this episode is not about the Wobblies, so I don't want to go too far off track here, but basically the IWW membership numbers were extremely up and down, even month to month at this time, and you know, really throughout their entire existence. They tended to get thousands of new members before, during, and after strikes, or even during migratory work seasons along the West Coast, but just as many would leave the union when they went home or work became more steady. But increase the membership it did, and in no small part due to Big Bill's strong voice, leadership, and energy. Bill was described by one man as being quote-unquote demonically energetic. And this is not hard to believe if you've ever read anything about the man. He never stopped from the time he was nine years old right up until his death. As a fellow who struggles at times with self-motivation, he was truly impressive, at least to me, if I'm being honest. So in 1910, Haywood was elected as a representative delegate to the Second Socialist International in Copenhagen, much to his own surprise. He went to Western Europe after the convention and traveled a bit, visiting mining communities and talking to his European labor counterparts. It was on a tour of a Scottish town called Lanarkshire, where he described the following scene that affected him deeply, which I will read to you. Quote, On one side of the street was a four-story ramshackle brick building, in which lived about 500 laboring men. They did their own cooking in a greasy kitchen. There was a slimy bathhouse. They slept in dirty wards. This was called, for some reason that I was never able to fathom, the model house. Across the street from it was a sheer blank wall as high as a penitentiary wall. Behind the blank wall was a great mansion with hundreds of rooms in which lived just one man, the Duke of Hamilton. I went to see the mausoleum of this noble family. One of the tombs was of black basalt and had been brought from Egypt. These aristocratic grave robbers had dumped out the original owner and had brought the sarcophagus to Scotland. When the Scot died, they found that his body was too long for the coffin. As it was impossible to lengthen the stone coffin, they had to double up the occupant's legs in order to crowd him in. There he rested as comfortably as such a crooked man could. End quote. 
On one side of the street, a rank, rotten boarding house with 500 working men trying to live inside of it. On the other side, a glorious mansion, home to just one non-working man. And between them, a massive blank wall, placed there for two reasons. The first, and probably the most important for the good noble duke, was to prevent his noble gaze from falling upon such presumably wretched beasts. The second reason was much the same just from the other point of view, to prevent the workers who labored, sweated and bled, and lived in filth and rot from seeing the truly wretched beast on the other side of that great class-defining wall. When Haywood returned to the United States, another career defining labor activity would fire Haywood's name into the stratosphere. In 1912, a strike encompassing all of the mills in Lawrence, Massachusetts began, a strike which would come to be known as the Bread and Roses Strike, and a strike which we here at Tribunus Plebis Media did an entire history episode about, which will be linked in the description. If you were not a listener back then, it is very much worth your time and effort, as it is one of the most important labor movements in the history of the country. During that strike, two innocent IWW members were imprisoned for murdering fellow worker Anna Lopizzo, a murder committed by the police, according to over 30 witnesses. Bill Haywood and other IWW leaders went to Lawrence to take control and oversee things personally after these murders and arrests. This was perhaps Big Bill Haywood's finest hour as a labor organizer, an event which would catapult him to the very top of the labor hierarchy and cement his position atop the IWW and in the minds of the nation's news watchers, politicians, and capitalists. It was Big Bill's idea, along with Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, some accounts say it was Bill's idea, others that they both worked on it, Maybe it was uh, Gurley Flynn's idea. I don't know, so I'm including them both here. Uh, But anyway, the idea was to send the scared, hungry children of the 25,000 striking Lawrence mill workers, almost all of whom were women, across New England and into New York City. Haywood had heard of a similar tactic working in Germany and France, I believe, and the IWW made it happen in Lawrence. The idea behind it was to send these children to sympathetic households and communities who would take care of the children, but also would actively get their story out to the world. And it kind of sort of really worked very well. The first load of children arrived in New York City to a huge IWW-sponsored fanfare, where the children were very publicly given clothes and food and allowed to tell the story of their hunger and fear. And this did generate some publicity, but not a tidal wave. However, when the Lawrence mill workers saw this, they did not like it. No, sir, not one bit. So they sent the cops in when the next wave of children was set to be picked up and sent via train to Vermont. The police arrived at the train station and soon began beating families cracking women's skulls and separating families and imprisoning parents. But aside from the police on that train platform, there were reporters. And the news of what happened that day, both to the women and the children, it galvanized support of the workers. It was truly a brilliant tactic from Big Bill and Girlie Flynn to take care of the children in this way. And I do want to stress that these children actually did need this help. They needed food and clothes and safety, This wasn't entirely fictitious or made up, but it was the violence of the capitalists and the police which really turned the tide on the strike. And it was the same sort of violence, both private and state, which would begin to turn its steady gaze towards the IWW and Big Bill Haywood over the coming years. And this is not even mentioning the burgeoning rift amongst the political left concerning Haywood's actions. The Socialist Party of America, where Haywood had long been a member, even attending the Second International as a delegate of the party, began to view Big Bill and his Wobblies with apprehension. 
Central to the issue was the IWW's, and by extension Big Bill's, inclination away from the ballot and towards direct action, up to and including violence and sabotage. This led to Haywood being voted off the National Executive Committee to which he had been voted in 1912, and, eventually, he would be recalled by a margin of more than two to one. This loss prompted Bill Haywood to leave the Socialist Party, and thousands of IWW members and those who supported them left with him. The IWW continued to organize and recruit members over, you know, the next five years or so, eventually reaching a peak of over 150,000 workers across the country in 1917. And Big Bill Haywood was an integral part of this rise, and he eventually would serve two terms as general secretary treasurer within the organization. Immediately after the Lawrence Textile Strike, the Bread and Roses Strike, another strike broke out amongst New Jersey silk workers who were IWW members, and it was led by Elizabeth Gurley Flint. It was actually quite similar to the Lawrence Strike in regards to the underlying causes and demands, but the fact that the Wobblies had organized the workers and had a solid presence before the strike began was a big factor in how well it ran. Bill Haywood's big contribution to this particular strike was in helping organize an already decentralized union into democratically and locally elected strike committees to free them from both potential national IWW pressure, but more importantly, to protect them from more conservative unions, which might try to undermine the wobbly strikers. And Samuel Gompers and the American Federation of Labor did try to do just that, but the strike committees were able to throw off the attack. Two men were murdered in Patterson, bystander Valentino Modestino, fatally shot by a private guard on April 17th, and striking worker Vincenzo Madonna, fatally shot by a strike breaker on June 29th. One man murdered fighting for his life, and the other murdered simply for watching, one by a private cop and one by a scab. Big Bill and nearly 2,000 other Wobblies and Silk workers were arrested over the course of the strike as well. Just another in a long line of arrests for Bill Haywood. Unfortunately, the strike itself unraveled in the end. Again, a story for another day, but the Patterson strike might be the most important moment in time which signaled the end of the IWW as a force along the east coast of the country. It was in this same period when Haywood was down in Virginia at an IWW meeting for a meeting of lumberjacks and sawmill workers, and the crowd was entirely made of white people. The IWW and Big Bill were both well known for open doors to people of all colors. It was one of, if not the only, significant union at the time which allowed people of any race and gender to join. After all, they viewed class solidarity over everything else. And Big Bill, from the time he saw that black man lynched by a mob in Utah to seeing the black man next to him being racially insulted by a United States senator in that same state, he had been averse to racism ever since. So when he saw those segregated union meetings, this is what followed. Quote, I knew that the lumberjacks and mill workers of that part of the country were both black and white. And when I went to the convention hall in Alexandria, I was very much surprised to find no blacks in the session. When I inquired as to the reason, I was told that it was against the law in Virginia for white and black men to meet together. The black men were meeting in some other hall. I said, you work in those same mills together, Sometimes a black man and a white man chop down the same tree together. You are meeting in convention now to discuss the conditions under which you labor. This can't be done intelligently by passing resolutions here and then sending them out to another room for the black men to act upon. Why not be sensible about this and call the blacks into this convention? If it is against the law, this is the one time when the law should be broken. The blacks were called into the session without a murmur of opposition from anyone. The mixed convention carried on its work in an orderly way, and when it came time to the election of delegates to the next IWW convention, 
black men as well as white were elected. End quote. Now, this isn't to say that Haywood was the only labor person pushing for this stuff, or that he was in any way perfect. After all, the IWW itself allowed anyone to join. But Haywood did see something that many other organizers and activists failed to see, including Eugene Debs. When I did my episode on Debs, one of the big misses I noted was his failure to get black people into the unions. While I found nothing that would suggest Debs was a dyed-in-the-wool racist or anything like that, his stance was that the union should be open to blacks, but that black people would need to find their way through the union doors. No assistance would be given. Big Bill understood that simply opening the door is not enough, and that the union itself, and anyone with the ability to fight for other people, needed to sometimes build ladders, stairways, or even just offer a hand to help people through that door. Sometimes laws are not just, and unjust laws need to be broken. Being not racist isn't enough. We need to actually work against racism. Saying black people should be here as well isn't enough. It had to be demanded, fought for, even when racist laws made it illegal. Actual solidarity had to be shown, and Bill Haywood understood this simple truth, and he was never afraid to actually do, not just talk about it. And racism, alas, was not all of the country's problems at the time, however. This country in the mid-teens was in trouble. It was, in fact, teetering on the edge of a true economic emergency, and the IWW was showing cracks as well. Haywood notes in his autobiography this, Quote, from San Francisco and other cities, they, meaning desperate people, started a march to Sacramento to make an appeal for aid to the legislature. They were met by citizens who were armed with pick handles, and they were drenched with the fire hose and driven to the outskirts of the city. In New York City, the unemployed were organized by the IWW. They installed a soup kitchen and went to the churches to sleep, but were told by the priests and the ministers that the churches were not domiciles. Many of them were arrested and served time in prison. End quote. All that and a European expansionary imperialist war had recently broken out on the continent. Quote, when the war broke out, I was struck dumb. For weeks, I could scarcely talk. I spent much time in the libraries, the chess club, and at Udell's little bookshop on North Clark Street in Chicago. I could not concentrate my mind on chess, but at least there was no conversation as I watched the games. I could not read as my mind was fixed on the war. I never felt any doubt about the United States. Wilson had been re-elected to the presidency the second time because he kept us out of the war. I knew that when the magnates of Wall Street pushed the button, that the oyster from Buzzard's Bay would swell up just as flamboyantly as the buzzard from Oyster Bay did during the Spanish War. End quote. It was at this time that Haywood and the IWW came under intense pressure. And there are definitely times where IWW and Haywood here were used interchangeably by the state and by the press as well. Basically, the government declared a quiet but open war on the industrial workers of the world, along with their biggest mouthpiece. Agents infiltrated meetings in the union itself wherever they could. And where they couldn't, they simply sat outside and listened to the meetings. In 1916, Facing atrocious working conditions and an increased demand due to the prospects of war, IWW lumber workers, who produce primarily spruce, a wartime necessity, struck. And then they chartered two boats to make formal complaints and to picket down the coast. When they arrived at the pier, they were met with a volley of gunfire and pistol fire from the local sheriff and his deputies. Five union members were killed and many more were wounded. The rest were pulled from the ship and arrested and then tried for murder as several had returned fire at the mob of violent police. 
After a long imprisonment, they were released to the man, but the point was obviously made. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, the police raided a wobbly meeting and arrested all those in the building and brought them to jail. The police, unable to conjure up any actual charges to use against the members, decided to simply abduct them and drive them outside of the city limits where a mob tied them to trees and beat them with cudgels until they were dripping with blood. But that wasn't enough for this so-called law and order mob, and they then poured hot tar onto the beaten, lacerated bodies of their victims, and then topped it off by throwing feathers on them. This is when Big Bill received a letter from his daughter telling him that his wife was dead. Bill, as usual, handled the news, at least according to this book, with characteristic stoicism, and says that he realized that she was released from her suffering at long last. She was buried in Nevada, next to her parents. Regarding the war, Haywood wrote the following in April of 1917 in a bulletin for the IWW. Quote, Since the last bulletin, President Wilson has proclaimed a state of war against the imperial government of Germany. A volunteer army has been called for, and, possibly, conscription measures which will be passed by the United States Congress. All class-conscious members of the industrial workers of the world are conscientiously opposed to spilling the lifeblood of human beings, not for religious reasons, as are the Quakers and the friendly societies, but because we believe that the interests and welfare of the working class in all countries are identical. While we are bitterly opposed to the imperialist, capitalistic government of Germany, we are against slaughtering and maiming the workers of any country. In many lands, our members are suffering imprisonment, death, and abuse of all kinds in the class war which we are waging for social and industrial justice. End quote. Essentially, it declared that all wobblies should resist enlistment and resist the war. This next thing is only related tangentially, but I always liked this quote. In South Dakota, a farmer and socialist named Fred Fairchild said, according to those who accused him of sedition, quote, If I were of conscription age and had no dependents and were drafted, I would refuse to serve. They could shoot me, but they could not make me fight. End quote. They can shoot me, but they can't make me fight. Fairchild would serve a year sentence in Leavenworth Prison for that statement, joining thousands of other men who had been imprisoned under the Sedition Act across the country. Now, there are many tales like this concerning how the government and angry mobs treated the IWW members. Murders, arrests, beatings, and spying, too many to list and discuss, to be honest with you. But the sum total really is that the IWW opposed the war opposed enlistment in the draft, and opposed anyone who supported the war. Wobblies were summarily ejected from the group as soon as it was discovered that they joined any army across the globe. On July 28th, Ralph Chaplin published another notice in the Wobblies paper that read in part this, quote, The IWW has placed itself on record regarding its opposition to war, and also as being bitterly opposed to having its members forced into the bloody and needless quarrels of the ruling class of different nations. The principles of the international solidarity of labor to which we have always adhered makes it impossible for us to participate in any and all of the plunder squabbles of the parasite class. End quote. Big Bill and the IWW's great sin was in effecting a strike in Butte, Montana, something which was made illegal in wartime. After the latest Wobbly meeting and after the publication of that statement I read a portion of, the federal agents raided IWW headquarters and every satellite office they could find and began arresting people, Big Bill Haywood included. The leaders of the IWW were charged with five counts, all stemming from laws passed after Woodrow Wilson declared war. Ironically enough, the prison Haywood was taken to was the same prison where the Haymarket martyrs were held before their executions, one of the key defining moments in Haywood's own life and his tireless work. 
Another interesting and kind of darkly humorous anecdote from the autobiography was this, quote, some of the boys, when asked about their religion, answered, the industrial workers of the world. The guard said, that's no religion. Well, they replied, that's the only religion I've got. Another question that was asked was, who is your best friend? One member said, Bill Haywood. The guard said, he can't do you any good. He's in here with you. The answer back was, that's all right. He's my best friend. End quote. And I think we can all take a lesson here and point to that quote when people ask what solidarity means. Now, Bill Haywood here, he went to trial. And before we go on, I do want to emphasize that the onset of World War I and the declaration of war followed by the Espionage Act, they all gave the government a weapon to use against labor organizers and socialists, and wield it they did. They swept up Eugene Debs, and he spent years in prison. They also got people like writer and anarchist Emma Goldman, and newspaperman Victor Berger, none of whom did much more than to resist enlistment in the military and advocate for others to do the same. So Haywood, well, he was tried with 100 other IWW members, and the trial lasted for five months. It was overseen by Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, a man more famous for being the first commissioner of Major League Baseball and for dealing with the 1919 Black Sox cheating and gambling scandal than anything else. Big Bill would testify for three days in that five-month-long trial, but to no avail. All 101 people on trial were found guilty, and 15 of them, including Haywood, were sentenced to 20 years in prison. After being imprisoned, Haywood was released on a $15,000 bond posted by William Bross Lloyd, a millionaire who was a supporter of Haywood, pending the adjudication of his appeal. While he was out, he would do his best to rescue the IWW, which had by this time begun to fall on hard times, a free fall from which it would never truly recover. He traveled from coast to coast and border to border, raising thousands of dollars for his union and for his own defense. As he traveled, news came in from the courts. Appeals were being denied, and the Supreme Court was his last hope. Seeing no help coming from the highest court in the land, his friends began to suggest and then urgently ask him to move to Russia rather than spend the rest of his life in prison, an idea which he fought against at first. But after thinking about it for a while, he declared that it would not be easy for him to leave the country but that he would try. In 1921, he was booked on a friend's boat, the SS Oscar II, the former famously failed peace ship of future Nazi supporter Henry Ford, which he had sailed to Europe to try to end the conflict in 1915 and failed in spectacular fashion. Big Bill spent his last night in America with the Lettish family and then had his last breakfast in the United States at a hotel in Hoboken, New Jersey. He hid in his berth until the ship was underway, and when he did emerge atop the decks, this is what he saw and thought. Quote, when I came on deck, we were passing the Statue of Liberty. Saluting the old hag with her uplifted torch, I said, Goodbye, you've had your back turned on me too long. I am now going to the land of freedom. End quote. So it passed that while out on bond, Haywood left the country. Basically, everyone involved was surprised by this, none more so than the IWW and his own lawyer who said this, quote, Haywood has committed harikari so far as the labor movement is concerned. If he has really run away, he will be disowned by the IWW and all sympathizers, end quote. Mr. Lloyd, the man who posted the bond which freed Haywood, did not get his $15,000 back. The ship would eventually land in Riga, the capital city of Latvia, and Big Bill and numerous others were loaded onto boxcars for the ride to the Russian border. When the train did finally cross into Russia, there was a burst of applause and a singing of the international. When the train arrived in Moscow, the group was met at the station with automobiles and brought to a comfortable hotel. Haywood was asked if he would like to go to the Kremlin to meet Vladimir Lenin, but he declined citing his diabetes and being tired after the trip. 
This was the beginning of Big Bill Haywood's life in Russia, but also the beginnings of various health concerns which he would battle for the rest of his life. A few days later, Bill Haywood met Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. The only portion of the conversation they had which Haywood wrote in his book is this, quote, I asked Comrade Lenin if the industries of the Soviet Republic are run and administered by the workers. His reply was, yes, Comrade Haywood, that is communism, end quote. And that, my friends, is, by any honest standard, the end of Big Bill Haywood's autobiography. It literally stops with the line, yes, Comrade Haywood, that is communism. It is the last thing Bill Haywood wrote in his book. But it's not the end of the story, or really the end of the book. After Big Bill's death, another chapter was added to the autobiography at the request of publishers. Chapter 25 would be tacked on and entitled Haywood's Life in the Soviet Union. Now, obviously, autobiographies suffer a certain issue. They are written by a person about themselves, and they tend to treat that subject very well. This, I suppose, is only human nature. But this last chapter kind of reeks of being overly fond of Bill Haywood, which makes sense because it was one of his good friends in Russia who wrote it, in the months immediately after Haywood's death. According to this chapter, Haywood was hailed as a hero in the Soviet Union and the Communist Party. He lived in a comfortable hotel, and his opinion was often sought by the press, and he was a center of attention for workers, and in particular, the American workers in Moscow. And he was much sought after by the leaders of the Soviet Union. He married a Russian woman, and would be amused to read accounts of how he was being persecuted by the quote-unquote Reds. He never did quite speak Russian very well, and more often than not, he communicated with his own wife in their own personal sign and gesture language, which I thought was kind of sweet. But another narrative emerged as well, and that was of a man abandoned and depressed. This report was that Big Bill was scraping by on a meager state pension, and he had been largely forgotten about almost immediately after the you know, the initial media hullabaloo from his arrival had died down. This second story described Bill Haywood as essentially a broken man who longed to go home. Now, how true are either of these accounts? They can't both be correct, right? They're quite different. Well, we do know a few things that all agree on. For example, he did marry a Russian woman, and he did join the autonomous Kuznets colony, where he worked and sat on the management board in 1922, and then moved to the Moscow office for Kuznets in 1923, and stayed there until 1925 when the Soviets took administrative control of the area. But beyond that, Big Bill's time in the Soviet Union is, as far as I can tell at least, open to a lot of interpretation and investigation. The version that was all rosy and happy, it was written by a friend and comrade in Russia, who both loved Bill and believed wholeheartedly in the Soviet project. The version that portrayed a bleak and tired man was written by folks who are avowed anti-Soviets and anti-communists. Somewhere in the middle lies the truth, a truth which I do not have for you, dear listener. What I can say is that in all his time in Russia, it appears that Big Bill Haywood never stopped learning about the labor situation in the United States, both through the news and through his radical labor connections. He never stopped communicating with his old comrades in the U.S. and never stopped wanting to go back home. But he refused to go until the workers had, in fact, won. Haywood would suffer a paralytic stroke on March 16, 1928. He spent some time in the Kremlin Hospital, but he wanted to go home, and eventually the doctors relented. After three weeks, he went home, Weak, but able to walk a bit. He was home for two months, doing some work here and there, but he never regained his full health. He suffered another paralytic stroke on May 18th and was again rushed to the Kremlin Hospital, but he would never recover. Big Bill Haywood died on May 18th, 1928, in Moscow, Russia. He was 59 years old at the time. His funeral was well attended, both by friends and representatives of the Communist Party and various international organizations. 
His flower-laden coffin was brought to a crematory under his wishes, and his ashes were divided into two parts, again at his request. One half of his ashes were entombed in the Kremlin Wall, and the other half of the ashes were sent to Waldheim Cemetery in Chicago and buried in the ground not too far from the Haymarket Affair Monument and amongst the graves of the victims of that terrible day and its bloody aftermath. Haymarket turned up throughout Big Bill's life. It was a key point in radicalizing the young Bill Haywood. As a confused teenager, he read the accounts of the affair and couldn't understand why so many police had shown up to the gathering, or who anarchists were, or why they had gathered. Neither could he understand why anyone would throw a bomb. But he knew something was not right when innocent men were hanged for a crime they didn't commit, and he knew then what it was to be of differing class. He was later imprisoned in the same cells as the Haymarket martyrs who were murdered by the state, and now, after his death, at least part of Big Bill Haywood is interred amongst his earliest comrades, even if he didn't have the words or the beliefs to describe them as such at the time. And now, he has become part and parcel of that most hallowed ground of the labor movement which he worked so long and so hard for. I think that William Big Bill Dudley Haywood would like that notion. And that, my friends, is the end of the episode. I hope you learned something. I hope you were entertained a little bit, and I hope you liked how we put this together. These episodes do take a lot of time and effort, and if you can spare just a couple dollars a month, we have a Buy Me a Coffee page where you can donate uh, monthly or you can make a one-time donation. You can donate as little as $3 a month, which is, I think it's pretty much a bargain. It's buymeacoffee.com slash tribunusplebis. Links, of course, are in the description. Please share, you know, subscribe, like, everything, comment. And I think that's it. I love you guys. Thank you.